If a person robs you on land, they are a thief. But if they rob you at sea, they're a pirate. Let's say it's 2007, and you're the captain of a cargo ship traveling off the coast of the Horn of Africa. You're transporting wheat from Kenya to Saudi Arabia. When you look out at the ocean and you see these guys, they come at you quickly, just a small speedboat of them. And soon they're right up against the side of your ship. They're about to throw a ladder to climb up. You run into the ship's citadel or safe room and you call the Coast Guard. Or maybe you try to spray them with this water hose to scare them away. But it's too late. They've now climbed on board. They're rounding up the crew. They're going to hold you hostage and demand a ransom of millions of dollars for anyone who will pay. The shipping company, your home government, your family, doesn't matter. And if you don't give them the money, you'll be held in captivity, starving, maybe even tortured, for days, weeks, months, even years. If there's no answer to payment of the ransom within three days, then um, the kidnappers here will sell me to, will sell me to Al-Shabaab. This happened hundreds of times. This is what a typical hijacking in this region looked like in the early 2000s, where by the end of the decade, hundreds of piracy incidents were reported every year, and they were still just getting started. So let me show you how the Horn of Africa became the epicenter of modern-day piracy, and how what started as Somali fishermen defending their waters turned into an organized criminal network. This is the rise and fall of Somali pirates. Off the Somali coast where those pirates attacked that vessel. You're dealing with irrational people. If they back this boat against the wall, I don't know what they are able to do. Okay, little sidebar really quick. Um, yes, I'm wearing my orange jacket inside because it's kind of cold in the studio. Anyway, one of my least favorite parts about living in the internet age is how tracked I am and how tracked we all are. I spend a lot of time on the internet and when I do that, all of my data, all of my browsing behavior, my purchase history, my address, my social security number, my location history is scraped by some shadowy company and put onto a list and then bought and sold in an open market. This is why my inbox is chaos, why my phone is always blowing up with robocalls, why I'm constantly being marketed to and sent stuff to my house that I don't want. It's a nightmare and it's getting worse every year. People's data is being more and more exploited, not just by marketers, but by recruiting companies and financial companies and risk management companies and people search sites so that people can search you. It's like not cool. Luckily, we all have rights to get ourselves off of these lists. The problem is no one's gonna spend the time going through the bureaucracy to actually get yourself off these hundreds of lists that you are probably on. And that is where Incogni comes in. Incogni is the sponsor of today's video, as you probably have gathered. And I'm very grateful to them for sponsoring the video and supporting our journalism. But also I'm grateful that they exist because I didn't know about them until they came to sponsor a video. And now I'm a super fan. You sign up for Incogni and you give them permission to go out on your behalf to take you off all of these lists. When I signed up for it, they were able to scan and see that I was on dozens of lists, over a hundred lists. And they were able to show me what lists I was on. It's all on this nice looking dashboard. And then the best part is you get to sit back and watch Incogni do all the work for you. Go and fight to get you off all of these lists. Sometimes that's as easy as just a little request that they do and they get you off the list. Sometimes they get pushback from the company and they will do that fight for you until you are off that list and you just get to sit back and watch it happen. I'm really glad that they invented this because it has been getting out of hand. Like we love the internet, it's great, but like this data exploitation thing is getting out of hand. And I swear someday we're gonna look back on all this and be like, that was the wild west. For now, Incogni is a great tool to protect you and protect your privacy. So there's a link in my description. It's incogni.com slash Johnny Harris. Click the link, you help support the channel, but you also get 60% off their annual plan. Why do you need an annual plan? Because when they take you off a list, inevitably, if you continue to use the internet, you'll end up back on that list. 
Incognite constantly monitors month after month to make sure that you stay off of these lists. Soon, your inbox will not look like pure chaos. Your phone will quiet down, mine sure has. And you can rest easy knowing that your data isn't just out there searchable by any corporation or person who wants it. So the link is in the description. Thank you Incognite for sponsoring the video. Let's dive into this big topic of pirates. Pirates aren't one thing. They've always existed. As long as there's been international trade on the ocean, there have been pirates. Sailors who utilize the expanse of the open ocean to rob and steal and run sophisticated businesses. If you haven't seen CGP Grey's deep dive on pirates, go watch it. It's a two-parter. Pirates are everything from Norse sailors who raided other ships on the high seas to the famous pirates of the Caribbean like Britain's Blackbeard who stole a French slave ship and souped it up into the ultimate pirate vessel. Pirates were poor men who were looking for money and social mobility. Some of them were looking for fame and glory and power in a time where seafaring men had little status or opportunity in society. We've romanticized them, we've caricatured them, and we idealize them as legends and myths of the past. But piracy never fully went away. It still very much exists today. Here's a map of all the piracy incidents over the past 40 years, at least the reported ones. From Indonesian pirates hijacking cargo ships in the Strait of Malacca, to Bangladeshi pirates holding fishermen hostage in exchange for ransoms all the way to West Africa, where Nigerian pirates steal oil off huge tankers and sell it on the black market. But most of the dots on this map are right here, the gateway to the Suez Canal, one of the busiest highways of global trade, off the coast of a country where piracy uniquely could thrive. The government of Somalia collapsed in the early 90s. The country fractured, and instead of a central government, local clans started to control patches of the country. There was no real government to regulate this 3,000 kilometer coastline, the longest coastline in Africa. As a result, huge fishing boats, mostly from Iran and Yemen, took advantage of this free-for-all, swooping in to these unregulated Somali waters to fish. These foreign fishers would steal hundreds of millions of dollars of seafood every year with nets that tear up the seafloor, destroying the ecosystem and depleting the fish stock in the process. This illegal fishing by foreign vessels started to outsize the catch of locals whose water this was. Local Somali fishermen with their tiny boats couldn't compete, and soon this illegal foreign fishing eclipsed the catch of local Somalis. Around the same time, companies from Switzerland and Somali's former colonizer Italy were illegally paying corrupt factions of the Somali government to take their toxic waste, some of it even being radioactive. Tons of this waste ended up in both Somalia's land and water, which would go on to have significant effects on the health of local communities. So, it's the 1990s, and between the illegal overfishing and the waste dumping, Somali people's main livelihood is being pillaged by foreigners, and they don't really have a government to help them out, to protect them. So some Somalis decided to fight back. An American cargo ship taken over by pirates. Somali fishermen got together and they formed an ocean militia. Some would call themselves the Coast Guard, and they would use these tiny boats to chase down foreign fishing vessels and demand that they pay a fine. Some experts have called this subsistence piracy because it was piracy, but it was also kind of fishermen defending their livelihood from predatory foreigners. And at first, it was rare. I mean, if you look at the data, you just see a handful of successful incidents every year. Year. Oh, and they were pretty basic too. Like in one of these early incidents of Somali piracy, back in like 1994, you got this wooden boat full of 26 Somali men claiming to be the Somali Coast Guard. And they go up to a shipping vessel and they get on board. They like hijack it for five days, but realize they can't really do anything. So they just steal as much as they can from the cargo ship and just go on their way. 
Yes, this was piracy, but it was super basic and kind of harmless. It was a bunch of locals filling in on the power vacuum left by their non-existent government. And this is how it was for a long time. Loosely organized gangs of armed Somali men climbing aboard cargo ships or fishing vessels, intimidating the crews to collect fines, or sometimes asking for informal license fees for fishing in their waters, even though they didn't have any authority to give out licenses. They did it to get money, to basically be like, if you're going to fish in our waters, you need to pay us. And the rest of the world didn't really know about this. It like wasn't big enough news for anyone to care. But that would soon change. Across the region, 80,000 people are dead. At least 22,000 of them were killed here in Sri Lanka. So there's kind of a turning point. Christmas 2004. This tsunami was devastating, mostly in Southeast Asia, but it also hit Somalia's really delicate coast, destroying homes and boats and crippling an already delicate economy and food supply. The tsunami took the lives of some 150 people in Somalia and poisoned the precious little water supply that people had here. And it also washed up some of that toxic waste that had been dumped off their shores. This led to a UN investigation which concluded that the waste was likely causing severe damage to the health of local people. And at this point, Somalia still isn't one country. There's some parts of the country that are peaceful and safe and under government control, but most of Somalia is still a patchwork of competing clans and warlords, a hotbed for terrorism and organized crime networks that control different parts of the country. And piracy, this thing that started off as an informal coast guard, was maturing in sophisticated ways. <laughs> By 2005, you start to see pirates using motherships, larger ships that allow them to go way further off their coast, and then to use speedboats to attack like they did to this cargo ship. This was a huge level up for Somali pirates. These motherships started to be equipped with radar, which allowed the pirates to have new ways of detecting their prey. You start to see them have GPS systems or satellite phones to communicate. Pirates start looking at shipping industry blogs and databases to locate and track shipping vessels. This was turning from basic subsistence piracy to something more sophisticated. Pirates started to realize just how much money and value was flowing through this corridor, headed towards the Suez Canal, like one of the busiest highways of international trade in the world. And with these new and improved tactics came more profitable business models that would change everything for pirates. Police in Finland say the owner of the missing freighter Arctic Sea has received a demand for a ransom. It was the early 2000s and it was the beginning of the era of ransoms. You were kidnapped yeah. by Somali pirates mm -hmm. and you were held hostage for more than two years. Yeah. Hey Michael, it's Johnny Harris. Hi Johnny, good to, good to hear from you. Hi. So we had a really interesting conversation with this American journalist named Michael Scott Moore. He was kidnapped by Somali pirates and held for almost three years before being released for a $1.6 million ransom. The people say, oh, but they're just frustrated fishermen. Mm. They're not. They were in the 90s, but it was a much bigger deal than just fishermen turning to piracy. Ransoms changed everything. Pirates were realizing how easy it was to hold a ship hostage and to demand a multi-million dollar ransom to extract a huge profit, which attracted the attention of warlords who saw a business opportunity. Warlords now wanted to fund hijackings, like this one where pirates were hijacking a Ukrainian coal ship that was traveling from South Africa to Turkey. They could hold it hostage and release it only in exchange for $700,000, which is what they got. Or another instance where pirates riding on speedboats captured this Japanese ship and its 20-person crew, holding them hostage until somebody coughed up $2 million. There was investment in these pirate operations because there was a return to be had. And by 2007, around 30% of the world's pirate attacks occurred within this circle. But wait, let's keep this in perspective. This actually wasn't particularly high. If you look at a graph of all of the other regions of the world, you'll see that this wasn't by any means an outlier. But watch what happens the next year. This line going up represents the expansion of the piracy industry in Somalia. 
There was way too much money to be made here, and warlords were getting better and better at investing in and running pirate businesses. By 2009, this body of water off of Somalia was home to nearly half of all piracy incidents on Earth. And look at this graph of the average ransoms paid. In 2008, the average ransom was a million dollars. A total of $30 million was paid out that year. And you gotta keep this in perspective, these were huge sums of money for anyone, but especially poor fishermen turned pirates in a country with a GDP per person of $517 per year. But even still, this was just the beginning. If you simply uh, refuse to pay, I mean, the pirates have a lot of hostages. Uh, the consequences of, of those being shot, for instance, would be unimaginable. All of this influx of ransom cash kicked off a pirate economy cycle, where pirates would attack a ship, hold the crew hostage, and get paid a high ransom. They would bring this back to the clan leader warlord who funded them, which would make that person rich, and allow them to invest in bigger boats, and more guns, and recruiting more young men, and appeasing the local coastal communities who would support them, which they would use to hijack more ships in more sophisticated ways. And it repeated and repeated, getting more and more sophisticated and dangerous each time. So a businessman who, who gets to be so rich that he needs to protect his business interests with gunmen, that's a war. And a, a, a pirate boss is nothing else. He's a, he's a businessman who invests in piracy. And the pirate businesses had lawyers and cooks and banknote tellers with machines that could detect fake bills so that they could know if their ransom cash was real or not. There was this great reporting at the time in 2009 by Reuters. One of their journalists went to a pirate town that had been a sleepy fishing village, but had turned into a booming pirate hub or in their words, pirate lair. What Reuters found was that this economy was so booming that they had created a stock exchange where any local in the town could invest what they had into a piracy business. There were dozens of these piracy businesses and you can invest in the one that you think is gonna go get a successful ransom by hijacking a international shipping vessel. And people made a lot of money. One local said they made $75,000 in just a couple months because they had made a good bet on the right pirates. Pirate bosses were not just, you know, top pirates. They were investors who had a portfolio of businesses. These pirate businesses would in turn support these communities, help fund the schools and the hospitals in order to curry favor with the locals to make sure that they would support them running their businesses. But the people who were really getting rich here were mostly the clan leaders, the warlords, who were building massive villas and buying luxury cars and throwing lavish drug-laden parties. This was no longer the DIY Coast Guard. This was now lucrative, organized crime. And yet, some of these pirate groups still tried to make a moral case as to why they were justified in doing this, saying that this wasn't piracy, this was retaliation for all of the exploitation of Somali waters by foreign countries. You see this in a 2008 hijacking of a Ukrainian vessel when these pirates demand $8 million, claiming that they would use the money to clean up the toxic waste that European companies had dumped in their waters. Yes, European companies have dumped toxic waste in Somalia. Were these pirates actually going to use the $8 million to clean that up? Probably not. At least that's what we found in our reporting. A lot of the moralistic, like Robin Hood narrative became really thin once warlords got involved and once they demanded a return for their investment. And you just start to see how thin this moral argument is when when pirates start boarding ships and just shooting crew at random to show how serious they were and to increase the likelihood of getting a high ransom payout. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, there is one seaman from mainland which was, uh, who was killed by, by the Somali pirates. Or when they started hijacking UN ships that were full of food and medical aid meant for Somali people. Uh, the ship apparently was bound for Mombasa, Kenya, and the shipment included vegetable oil, corn, soy blend, and other basic food commodities bound for uh, people in countries including Somalia, Uganda, and Kenya. This was about money and power, and it was able to thrive because of a country that didn't have a government that actually controlled the country. By 2011, there were 237 piracy incidents here. Over 1,200 hostages were taken that year. 35 of them died while in captivity. 
this was becoming more and more deadly and more and more lucrative. Let's go back to that graph of the average ransoms that were paid. You can see it grow up to around $5 million for the average ransom. The total number of ransoms paid in 2011, $150 million. It was getting out of hand, but it would take a few key events for the world to really take notice. Ladies and gentlemen, dear gentlemen, all ships stay inside, stay inside, stay inside. We are trying to stay ashore. Try run away from them now. Stay inside, everybody. This is a, a real alarm. Please stay inside. There's this funny thing in international news where in order for the world to take notice of something, it sort of has to affect, like, Westerners. And that's no different with pirates. There was this one incident in uh, fall of 2005 where a group of pirates showed up to a luxury cruise ship. It was full of Western tourists. They hit us with... Um, um, rocket rocket grenades, RPGs, and um, and the they there was a woman in her cabin, and she was fortunately in in her bathroom, but a rocket grenade went right through and blew the whole cabin out. The cruise ship escaped, but it still led to global news coverage. Another incident was in 2008 when a Ukrainian ship was hijacked by these pirates. Little did these pirates know, they had just stumbled upon a shipment of tanks and grenades and ammunition bound for Sudan. They were demanding $35 million to give it back, holding the crew and the ship hostage. The US and Russia both freaked out here, and they sent in their navies to like monitor the situation to make sure the pirates weren't going to take the weapons off the boat. In the end, the pirates agreed to a $3.2 million payout, and the secret weapons shipment continued onward. It was a big scare, and it was another step in waking the world up to how big of a deal this was becoming. But the biggest event happened a few months later. A U.S. container ship was traveling from Oman to Kenya when four pirates boarded and hijacked the ship holding the crew hostage and demanding $2 million. The US government has a firm policy that it doesn't negotiate with hostages, but what they do do is send in their military. So after four days, the Navy SEALs arrived with snipers. They shot three of the four pirates and rescued the crew. It was an incident that was later depicted in this Tom Hanks movie. These were dramatic events, a hostage situation with snipers and Navy SEALs, and it spread into the international news cycle in a way that Somali piracy just hadn't before. But Captain Phillips was taken hostage for almost five days and then rescued by the U.S. Navy. It was clear that this had become too lucrative of an economy. There was too much incentive for warlords to get in on all of this money for it to stop. The only way to slow this down was a serious intervention. As we were reporting this story, I kept asking, like, why is this such a difficult problem to solve? And we asked all of the experts we interviewed, and we have a pretty good idea now why this is way more complicated than expected. First off, guns. You can't really carry guns on international shipping vessels, partly because there's international gun laws that are complicated, partly because shipping companies don't want guns on boats because it can be a weird liability thing. You can't just have like a gun in a safe box somewhere. Second, it's hard to send in the navies to patrol these waters because pirates often don't look like pirates until it's too late, at which point they're prone to use their victims as human shields against any threatening navy. So unless you've got like the best sniper in the world, like the Navy SEALs, it's actually really hard to use just like military force against these pirates. And lastly, you have to remember what we're talking about. We're talking about the open ocean, huge swaths of water. It's really challenging to monitor and control this in an effective way. It's one reason why piracy has always thrived on the open sea. But even despite all these challenges, governments and businesses put their heads together and they figured something out. The first one's kind of boring. It's this report that this international shipping organization put out that basically teaches ships and captains and companies how to protect themselves. They recommend them using this high pressure hose that allows them to just like spray water at the pirates. They started recommending putting barbed wire and razor wire around your ship. Kind of gnarly. Put locks on your doors. Increase your surveillance, like this is pretty basic stuff. Create a safe room or a citadel where you can like lock yourself in if you get hijacked. 
But one of the big things they did was create this internationally recognized corridor where ships could all travel together like in a caravan, sometimes escorted by a Navy ship from one of these countries, helping them navigate this really busy but very vulnerable part of the international shipping highway. And another huge step was, in spite of all the complicated gun laws, Vessels were now allowed to employ armed guards to stand watch as they navigate these waters. So now you've got like security guards with guns on the ship who have nothing else to do but like protect the boat. And guess what? All of these strategies totally worked. I mean, look at this graph. After its all time high in 2011, hijacking incidents plummeted because of these interventions. But this leaves us with kind of a complicated resolution here. These communities were left behind by their government. They don't have the infrastructure of a society where people can thrive and work. That's for a lot of reasons, but it's in part because of the pillaging and the exploitation from outsiders. And so while these warlords who committed horrific crimes to get rich deserve no moral justification. It is morally complicated when you look at people who are just trying to live, whose waters have been poisoned by toxic waste, whose country has been pillaged, and who turned to piracy as a last resort. But I'm not gonna go into the ethical dilemma here. I think you all can fight that out in the comments if you want. Um, I'd love to see what you have to say. The fact is, piracy was solved in the Horn of Africa because of these interventions, at least for the most part. But just as Somali piracy was declining, incidents of piracy started popping up on the other side of the continent. The Gulf of Guinea took Somalia's title as the piracy hotspot of the world. These attacks happen for different reasons and they look quite different. They're usually Nigerian pirates boarding oil tankers to steal the oil that they feel like was stolen from their land. The international community is now turning its focus here and this is a more complicated thing to solve for a lot more reasons. But the fact is piracy won't go away as long as the ingredients that have always fueled it exist. Frustrated young men with no chance of finding work in an economy, incentivized and organized by clan leaders looking to get rich on the high seas, operating in a gray area where the government and the society that should support them and employ them doesn't exist or is too weak to help, leaving them to fend for themselves and to turn to more and more sophisticated forms of crime in the process. if you caught it during the video but this is a map of uh mostly of east asia but you get this um somali peninsula and the gulf of aden and basically everything we've talked about it's all right here it's, it's really a beautiful map and when you look at it you can see just how important this suez canal is uh to global shipping anyway um yeah, I this I've wanted to look into Somali pirates forever. Like I've I've thought I've always I saw the news over the years and never really understood the the story, the the background and we reported on this and we talked to a lot of experts and there's actually a lot of politics in this. Um there's a lot of people who argue for like a vindication morally of Somali pirates saying that they're just retaliating against a a world who's who's exploited them and like that's there's a strong argument there um but i don't know again I, i'm really curious to hear what what people have to say about it yeah we are interested in making deeper and deeper videos like th this a video like this takes much more time and resources to like really understand to get the data like we got this whole data set that we used to map you know every incident like that's just just like a way bigger thing um but we want to do more of these, so I'm, I'm curious to hear from you um, what stories we should do next. For those who want to support this effort of making high quality factual videos, uh, we have a Patreon. It is called The Newsroom, that is what we call it, and it is a place where you can support with your money to help make possible what we do here. You can also uh, buy LUTs and presets, which are the things that we use to color our videos to make our videos look 
beautiful like this and not like this, which is what it looks like when we shoot it. I have a map poster that we sold out of, but then I'm pretty sure we reprinted it like a thousand more. So that should be in stock. Don't quote me on that. It could be sold out again by the time you're watching this. I have no idea. Yeah, go watch Search Party, which is our new channel that is created by my old Vox colleague and now my partner, Sam Ellis who is building that channel, but sort of under our broader uh, company here. And it's awesome and it is rigorous and amazing and really good journalism. It's called Search Party. It is here on YouTube. Um, and I think that's all the things I need to tell you about here in my little cozy couch setting. It's so dim in here. I feel like I could just take a nap on this couch and I just might. So thank you all for being here and for the support and the kind comments and the appreciation and we will see you soon in the next one. Bye-bye.